It's great to be with you today. Thank you for joining us for worship. Uh, pastor Paul and his wife Sherry are away this week on vacation. It's always good that our pastor is able to get away to be refreshed. And so we're going to be taking a break from our normal study verse by verse through the Gospel of Matthew. And so uh, tonight, today, this morning, we're going to be in uh, the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. Um, we're continuing our study about the Apostle Paul and God's amazing grace. So if you want... Uh, uh, a title for today's message is called The Apostle Paul to the Ends of the Earth. The Apostle Paul to the Ends of the Earth. Remember, the story of Scripture is not about us, how we come to God by trying to clean up our act, trying to play this re looking religious, dressing the part, talking the part, and trying to somehow earn our standing before a holy God. The story of Scripture is all about God and His great love for you and I coming down and saving the likes of you and I by His amazing grace. His unmerited, undeserved favor poured out into our lives through the finished work of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, God is on a mission. He's on a mission to seek and to save the world from its sin. He's on a mission to reconcile this lost and broken world back to Himself. You know, John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. You know, Jesus gave the commission to his disciples to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And again, he confirmed that call to the church right in the, uh, when he was uh, before the 500, before he ascended into heaven. In Acts 1.8, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and notice to the ends of the earth. You know, in the first century, God was at work bringing his plan to fruition to take the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. In Matthew's gospel, chapter 24, verse 14, Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Man, that sounds like a daunting task to do for 12 guys, doesn't it? To go and to take the gospel, the good news, to the ends of the earth. So how was it that God was going to do that? How was it that the Lord was gonna do this to take the gospel to the ends of the earth? Well, his heart and his plan was to do it through the church. The living body of the Lord Jesus Christ, his bride. This would be the vehicle that God would choose, a spirit-filled church, a grace-filled church, to take this gospel to the ends of the earth. And this is what the book of Acts is all about. It's about laying out and the, seeing this story unfold, how God was gonna lay out and take this gospel to save the world from its sin. Now the church in Jerusalem was dragging your feet from the command of Christ to go into all the world. It was struggling to break free from the religious mindsets of cultural Judaism and religious prejudices towards the Gentile world. Remember, they thought that they were a special breed, a special race unto themselves. They thought they were set apart because they, were, they had the special sauce, right? They had Moses, they had Abraham, they had the law, they had the prophets, and now they had the Messiah, who they were gonna keep all to themselves. But you know, that wasn't God's heart. God's heart was to take the gospel so that through, through Christ, all the nations of the world would be blessed. And because Jerusalem was dragging her feet, the church there in Jerusalem, God decided to raise up a Gentile church in Antioch. You know, Paul and Double B, Brother Barnabas, right? They were right in the middle of that grace-filled church in Antioch, some 300 miles north of Jerusalem. And God was doing an amazing work there. God was saving thousands of people. They were coming out of a paganistic lifestyle, out of an immoral lifestyle, and they were turning to the Lord. God was saving them, filling them with the Holy Spirit, and they were doing incredible things for the kingdom of God in this influential city. Antioch was the third largest city at that time in the known Roman world, next to Rome itself and Alexandria. And so God had saved Paul for purpose. This undeserving soul by his amazing grace, his unmerited, undeserved favor, and was going to parade him around that known Roman world, that Gentile world, proclaiming the good news 
of the Lord Jesus Christ, that God came to save sinners. So how did God use the apostle Paul to turn the Roman world upside down in a few short years? It is amazing to think what this guy did in a short amount of time. Paul had traveled over 10,000 miles over the course of his missionary journeys, proclaiming Christ. Notice he did it with no automobile, no airplane, no bicycle, no cell phone, no internet, and no marketing schemes. So what was it that he did to impact the world in such an incredible way? Well, Paul was called by God. And in Acts 13, the Holy Spirit said for the leaders there in Antioch to set aside Paul and Barnabas for the work that he had for them to do. Paul didn't do this work because it sounded like a good idea or it was something fun to do or was some adventure to set out on. He had the sense that God had called him to this work. And in Acts 20, 24, he says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and to complete the task the Lord Jesus has given to me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. And again, in Paul's epistles to the churches, he would confirm this. He would say, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor from man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Paul is saying, look, man didn't choose this for me. I didn't choose this for my life. God is the one who reached down and chose me. And this was the path that he had for my life. You know, you need to have a sense that God is calling you to a particular work because when there is persecution, it's not if, it's when. When you are persecuted or when times get tough or the honeymoon period wears off, you have to have that sense that God has called you to something. This isn't a good idea that your friends set out for you to do. It's easy to walk away from something your friends have you to do. But when your life is on the line, you have to understand that it is God who's called me to this work. It's his work. He's gonna protect me. He's gonna watch over me. He's gonna provide for me. And he is the one by his grace who's gonna sustain me through whatever trial that I face. Paul understood that he was given his orders by his commanding officer the Lord Jesus Christ. And he would write to Timothy and he would say, no one serving as a, good, as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Now, what is he saying? He's saying, look, Timothy, God has called you to a specific work. Don't get distracted from your kingdom assignment. There are all sorts of distractions in this world, aren't there? All sorts of things vying for your attention, your time, your energy that want to distract you from doing what it is that God has called you to. And each of us here today have a calling from the Lord. Are you living distracted from your kingdom purpose? Are you settling for just living for this world to get here? Or do you have your eyes set on the things above, on the things of the kingdom? Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, look, stay focused, stay on task. Paul was given a team by the Lord. God gave Paul a team, right? Now, having a team is always better than doing it by yourself, isn't it? If you have a big task at hand, man, I'd rather have a team of people to do it than by yourself, right? Everywhere that Paul went, God gave him a team of companions to walk alongside him. You know, life is rich with great friends, isn't it? If you're somewhere in the best part of the world, you could be there and be so lonely at Life stinks. You can be in the worst part of the world with great friends and companions and it can be an amazing thing. Laboring together, serving together. And Paul's team provided him with three things, safety, accountability, and encouragement. Now safety, traveling in the ancient world was dangerous. And especially if you were by yourself. If you're by yourself, you can seem, it can feel very vulnerable at times. And in Ecclesiastes 4.12, it says, though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. I love how the message version puts it. By yourself, you're unprotected, you're vulnerable. But if with a friend, you can face the worst. Can you round up a third? A three-stranded rope isn't easily broken. 
You know, there are safety in numbers, isn't there? You know, when Jesus had sent out the 12, he never sent them out by themselves. He sent them out with a partner in pairs, right? Accountability. You know, Pastor Paul, I'm so grateful for him. You know, at times he's mentioned to me, he said, Craig, the more eyes that you have on your life, the better it is. Because it'll keep you from getting into trouble. It'll keep you from making disastrous choices that could shipwreck your life. God gives us companions, relationship, friendships, the body of Christ to do life in front of everybody, out in the open. When you are in fellowship with a good group of friends, they know when something's off. They know when you're not quite leaning into the Lord. They know that, hey, why aren't you at Bible? Why aren't you at prayer? Because they can see something in your life and they can encourage you to come alongside you. Accountability, we need it. And encouragement, right? Now there are days that you wake up and you just wanna quit. Have you ever felt like quitting? Pulling back, you're like, you're just tired, right? You're tired of the fight, you just wanna stop. There are days that you just don't have the strength to continue to go on. But that well-timed text from a friend or an email or a call is everything that you need, that encouragement to wake up the next day just to keep going. Encouragement. Paul had his companions to come alongside him and encourage him. They prayed together. They fought in the trenches together. They carried each other's burdens. The enemy wants nothing more than to destroy your life, to render you ineffective for the kingdom of God. And he does it by discouragement, discouraging you. He wants you to quit. And Paul had his companions come alongside him to be a source of encouragement. So who are those companions in your life that God has called you to? Who are those companions that God has called you to come alongside to be a source of strength and encouragement? Do you give up easily? Have you abandoned your post? Do you make it easy for those leaders you're serving or do you make it very difficult? Paul had a great group of guys around him and he was able to go on to accomplish all that God had for him because of his encouragement from these guys. Paul was directed by the Holy Spirit. I believe that Paul's success was no doubt contributed to his ability to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's direction and leading in his life. This is God's work, it's a spiritual work. It's not man trying to muster up strength and try his own bright and brilliant ideas in his own mind. It wasn't Paul trying to ramrod something and trying to do it in the flesh. But Paul had to learn to keep in step with the spirit of God. I'm reminded of Acts 16. It says, now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, this is Paul on his second missionary journey, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. So there in the middle of the screen in, in uh, what is... Uh, Asia Minor, you see that province of Galatia, that Roman province of Galatia. And they had traveled through Galatia and Phrygia and the Holy Spirit forbid them to preach in Asia. There was a number of cities that Paul wanted to get to to go and preach there. And for whatever reason, God said, no, you're not gonna do that. Holy Spirit forbid them to go there. So what did he decide? Okay, well, we'll just go up to Bithynia, up there to the north. And the Holy Spirit did not permit them to do that. And in the middle of the night, he has a vision, a vision of a Macedonian man saying, come over to us, we need help over here. And so immediately they concluded that we're to go to Macedonia, that God wanted us to go there to preach the gospel. Now, oftentimes in our walk with the Lord, we think that a closed door is the enemy hindering us and coming against us, right? We're trying to push through, we're trying to have an open door so we can do the will of God. But God leads us just as often by a closed door as he does by an open door. And it was the third door that opened that God made clear for Paul to walk through, 
right? God was not ready for the gospel to go to Ephesus. Now he would later circle back around and God would lead him to Ephesus and God would pour out his spirit there and thousands would come to Christ. There would be a great revival that took place in that pagan culture. And then eventually all those cities would come to Christ. But Paul, but the Lord had something far greater for Paul in this moment. Paul, not, God not only wanted to give Paul a few cities, but he wanted to give him an entire continent, the whole continent of Europe to go and preach the gospel in. And because of Paul's simple act of obedience to yield to the Lord, not trying to ram something down in the flesh. He was sensitive to the Lord leading, God guiding, that the Dr. Luke was added to their missionary team there in Troas before they headed over to Philippi in Macedonia. Now Luke was a doctor. It'd be great to have a doctor in your traveling companion, especially for the apostle Paul who was hurt half, the, half his trip. But Luke would go on to write the gospel of Luke and then he would go on to write the book of Acts. Now that simple act of obedience to follow the leading of the spirit produced fruit that we can't even measure. He was ended up writing a portion of the scriptures, right? God opened up a way for him to preach the gospel in uncharted territory. And how exciting when we wait on the Lord and are sensitive to his leading. You know, brothers and sisters, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything we could ask, dream, or imagine. As we simply submit to him, we yield to his leading and guiding. It's his mighty power at work through each of us that he's able to accomplish far more than we could ever imagine. Notice Paul expected adversity. Paul knew that God had called him to this work to go and to advance the gospel. And when you are going in to take new territory or new ground, the enemy is not just gonna keel over and die. The enemy is gonna give up a fight. They're gonna come against you. They're gonna oppress you. They're gonna fight hard to the, to the end, aren't they? Paul told Timothy, look, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. If you're a good soldier, a good soldier expects there to be a battle to fight, expects there to be adversity when you go into a battle space, expects there to be adversity, right? Now, how is a soldier to prepare for adversity? Well, they're sent off to boot camp, right? Boot camp prepares you mentally, physically, and trains you for battle, right? Physically, how does boot camp train you? Well, you're doing all sorts of push-ups and sit-ups, right? You're running tons of miles. You're doing all of this type of stuff to make you one mean, lean fighting machine out there on that battle space, right? So that you know that, hey, if your buddy goes down, you're strong enough to be able to have, lift him out of that conflict, right? Or harm's way. Mentally, boot camp trains you, right? Mentally, it prepares you. They put you under so much duress, so much strain. You're cold, you're tired. You can't think because you have, you're sleep deprived. You're hungry, you have mud all over the place. You're wet. You've got sand everywhere. They make you miserable, uncomfortable so that you want to quit, so that you want to give up. They're trying to push you to the point of your limits so that they know when they put you in that battle space, when the bullets are flying, the mortar rounds are dropping all around you, that when you hear the orders from your commanding officer, you're able to fulfill them without thinking, without question, you just do it. You know, um, the believer, how are we to prepare for adversity? Well, we pray. We pray constantly. We're in the Lord's presence, asking him to grow us and to stretch us, asking him for his wisdom, his power. We're in the word. We're letting the word of God wash over our hearts. We're putting on the full armor of God daily. We're in fellowship with the believers around us. And we have the great gift of the Holy Spirit that resides in the heart of the believer to give us the power to do whatever it is that God has asked us to do. You know, Warren Wiersbe, he says, the Christian life is not a playground. It is a battleground. And we must be on our guard at all times. The Christian life is not a playground. It is a battleground and we must be on our guard at all times. Paul expected adversity. He's well accustomed to it. 
And to the Corinthians, he would say, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. You know, Paul and Timothy, here they are on their second missionary journey. Paul, Timothy, and Silas. And they made it to to Philippi by the direction of the Holy Spirit. And they get there, they're preaching the gospel. And this angry mob grabs him, drags him before the magistrate. They publicly beat him with rods. They're probably beaten, bruised, bleeding, extremely sore, in tons of pain, and they're thrown into prison. And in the midst of that prison, they're shackled to the wall. Paul and Silas lift their hands to the Lord and they begin to worship him. They begin to pray and sing songs to the Lord. And you know the story, the Lord miraculously delivers them through an earthquake, those shackles fall off. But in the midst of their adversity, the whole Philippian jailer's whole household and he himself gave his life to the Lord. Now, Paul and Timothy and Silas, they quickly leave Philippi and this is where we pick up in chapter 17. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Now notice, they... Here the pronoun changes from first person we. Dr. Luke is writing this document. He was with them in Philippi, but Paul left him there. So the pronoun changes back to they. Apparently Paul had left Luke over there in Philippi to encourage the believers. Now we don't have any mention that Timothy was left there. So we assume that Paul, Silas, and Timothy press on towards Thessalonica. Now Thessalonica, right? It was the capital city of that Roman province of Macedonia on what is what we call the country of Greece today. It was a port city, it was a main naval base, it had trade, it had commerce, and it was 100 miles from Philippi. Now notice, they, had, they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia and they came to Thessalonica, right? Just to give you an idea where this at, there's Troas there on Asia Minor, what is modern day Turkey, and they traveled across the Aegean Sea up to Philippi, and now they're making their way westward to Thessalonica. Now Amphipolis, was a 33 miles from Philippi. That was a day's walk. Apollonia was 30 miles from Amphipolis and Thessalonica was 37 miles from Apollonia. And so that was quite a lot of ground to cover by foot for anyone, especially in the first, uh, uh, in the ancient world, right? The average walking pace of a person is about three miles per hour, right? And that would have taken Paul and his companions around 10 hours each day to travel. So just to give you an idea, it's like if you're gonna wake up tomorrow morning and you're gonna walk to Indianapolis. You're gonna make it down to downtown around Circle Center down there. And that's about 117 miles, a little bit shorter than this. But you wake up tomorrow morning, you do your stretches, you get your protein shake, your protein bar, and you're like, okay, I wanna set out. And you walk 30 miles in about a day, right? 10 hours. You'd be probably sore, tired. You need, you know, you need some, something to eat. And, uh, and then the next day you wake up and you walk another 30 miles until you make it down to Indianapolis. It was about a three days journey, right? And so what made this sort of travel so accessible for Paul and his companions in the ancient world? Well, it was Roman technology, right? These engineers were highly advanced for their time. This was no doubt one of the reasons that uh, led to their dominance in the ancient world. They had the aqueducts, they had sewer lines and toilets, they had bathhouses, advanced weaponry. They were the inventors of concrete. Uh, They had and advanced roads, right? The Roman road technology made traveling much easier in the first century and especially for Paul and his companions. In an article, uh, sciencehowstuffworks.com, it says, it's impossible to mention Roman engineering without talking about Roman roads, which were so well constructed that many of them are still in use today. Comparing our own asphalt highways to an ancient Roman road is like comparing a cheap a watch to a Swiss version. They were strong, precise, and built to last, right? Roman roads, they, were, they had paved thousands of miles of roadways connecting their vast empire all the way around the, all the way, all the way from Rome to Great Britain, to Africa, to the Middle East. And this extensive highway system helped them keep control and dominance over many conquered cultures within their borders. You know, the Roman legions, their fighting force were able to travel long distances in a short amount of time um, to head off any posing threat to the empire. Their empire was vast. It was was huge. 
And they were able to fight off any thwarting threats because of the Roman road system that they had developed. Now, I love this post from Huffington Post. It says, the Roman roads of today are the internet, the smartphone, and social media. The famed Roman roads of the ancient empire were among the foremost technological advances that helped Christianity spread so rapidly. Their construction was strategically well-timed to the incarnation of Christ and the subsequent missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. The building of, this, of these continent-connecting arteries started in 500 BC and ultimately spanned over 250,000 miles. That's a long ways. They not only enabled the Roman Empire to grow, but also propelled the gospel forward. The new roads are having a similar effect. So here you have the Apostle Paul, his companions, and now the early church utilizing this technology that is at their disposal to quickly advance the gospel around the known Roman world. How awesome is that? And you know what? We have this incredible technology at our disposal, at our fingertips today. I remember in 2010, I got my first uh, smartphone. Here's a picture of me with my smartphone. Oh, wait, that's Zach Morris from Saved by the Bell. <laughs> my first uh, smartphone was the Blackberry Brick. Did anybody have a Blackberry Brick with a side scroll wheel on the side? It was amazing. I mean, I had a cell phone up to that point, and man, you could barely do anything with it. You could call someone, you could text that predictive text. You got to hit the button a million times to get the or and or whatever it was. But man, when I got my Blackberry, it was like, man, the world was opened up to me, right? You had instant messenger, you had the World Wide Web. I had all my emails coming directly to my phone, all the notifications. You even had Google Maps. Living in LA, Google Maps was amazing because you could find out how to get places, not have to print off directions or have an atlas in your car, right? And so opening, it opened up your world, having this the amount of information at your disposal with your smartphone. And not to mention FaceTime, it makes, you know, when, when family and friends live in different states or different countries, FaceTiming feels like you're next door. They're right there in the room with you. Some statistics about smartphones. In 2016, there were 3.7 billion smartphone users around the world. And a few short years later, seven years later, that number almost doubled to 6.8 billion smartphone users in the world. And in 2024, by the end, it is estimated that there will be 7.1 billion smartphone users around the world. Now, what is interesting about that is the, the world population is estimated at the end of 2024 to be 8.1 billion users. What an incredible opportunity of technology for the church to utilize to get the gospel out. The whole, uh, this whole generation is on their smartphone device, scrolling Mindlessly, numblessly, all day long. Not to mention the whole world. 7.1 billion users are using smartphone devices around the world today. Now this technology can be used for great good. Advancing the gospel, advancing the kingdom. But our adversary uses the world system as well to prey upon the vulnerable. This technology can also be used for a great evil, and it is being used for great evil. You look at the sexual addiction that is all around our country, preying upon uh, our, the most vulnerable and innocent, our kids, with smartphone devices. These companies are spending millions and billions of dollars to hook your kids on being sexually addicted to things. And brothers and sisters, we need to pray that the Lord will give us wisdom on how to navigate, how to use this technology for the advancement of the gospel. Now, Paul and his missionary team, they were strategic. And um, they had bypassed uh, these two smaller cities to get to Thessalonica, right? And the reason that they did that, it was probably the Holy Spirit leading them to do that. Because this was a, a, a city that was on a popular trade route, a port city, and a lot was happening. It was the capital city of, the, of uh, Macedonia, right? William Barclay says, the coming of Christianity to Thessalonica was an event of the first of importance. The great Roman road from the Adriatic Sea to the Middle East was called the Ignatian Way. And the main street of Thessalonica was actually part of that road. If Christianity was firmly founded in Thessalonica, it could spread both east and west along that road until it became a very highway of the progress of the kingdom of God. We don't need to be afraid of technology. We need to be wise. 
And we need to be able to use the technology at our disposal to further the kingdom of God, amen? We need to pray for wisdom, pray for understanding. Notice in verse two, then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths, that is into the synagogues, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Now, what was he doing? As was his custom. As Paul did in every new city that he went into, he went into the synagogue and he reasoned with the Jews and preached the gospel. Now, Paul went to the Jew first because it was an easy inroad into that culture. Paul Paul had a common ground with the Jew. They loved the law of God. He loved the law of God. He knew their traditions and customs because he grew up in their traditions and customs. And so this was an easy road into that culture. First go to the Jew. Now notice he reasoned with them for three Sabbaths. He spent three weeks there reasoning. Now what does that word reasoning mean? It means to converse, discourse with one or to argue or to discuss. The root word of reason is where we get our word dialogue. It means to talk back and forth. So the idea is that Paul was literally talking back and forth about the scriptures with the Jews on the Sabbath, asking questions and giving answers. Paul was dialoguing with the Jews about the Christ from the scriptures. Now he explained and he he was explaining and demonstrating about the Christ. And that word explains, it means to open. And the idea is to open one's understanding and to make clear. Paul simply opened the word of God, opened the scriptures and preached from them with clarity, with simplicity, the spiritual truths of God's word. You know, that is what preaching and teaching is. It's taking a passage of scripture. It's opening it. It's reading it. It's it's understanding what the spiritual truths are so that everyone can see them, they can understand them, and they can apply them to their life. You know, the gospel is simple so that even a child can understand it. And this is what Paul was doing. Paul was explaining and demonstrating to them what God did for them through the Christ, that the Christ had to suffer Christ took upon himself our sin, our iniquity, our shame. God's wrath had to be poured out because God is just. The Jew knew that God was righteous, that he was holy, and that he couldn't have fellowship with sin. Our sin had to be paid for or atoned for. How was our sin atoned for? It was by the shedding of blood. And not just any blood, but the blood of a perfect sacrifice, a perfect lamb. Jesus was the lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world, to reconcile us back to the Father so that we can have peace with God. Do you have peace this morning? God came to give you peace. Not as the world gives peace, but peace with our heavenly Father. Peace with God. Isaiah 53, five says, but he was wounded, that is, The Christ was wounded for our transgressions, our sin, our iniquity. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement, God's wrath was poured out upon him for our peace. And by his stripes, we are healed. By his stripes, we are made whole. Amen. We're made into a new creation. You know, Paul was arguing from the scriptures that this Jesus was the Christ, whom the Jews were looking for. They were waiting for the Messiah to come. And the Jews were expecting a deliverer to deliver them from Roman occupation, from Roman rule. But Jesus didn't come to deliver them as a great savior from Roman rule, but to deliver them from their sin. And Paul is arguing with them that the prophets foretold that the Christ would suffer and that he would be glorified. Ellicott's commentary for English readers says, better that the Christ is pointing to the expected Messiah, the anointed of the Lord, whom all Jews were expecting, but whom they were unwilling to recognize in the crucified Jesus. The argument was therefore to show that prophecy pointed to a suffering as well as a glorified Messiah, and that both conditions were fulfilled in Jesus. Paul gave a thorough defense of the faith from the scriptures to these Jews and Greeks that Jesus was the Christ. You know, the Jews, they knew the scriptures. From the time that they were young, they grew up understanding what the scriptures were saying. 
Now, Paul came along and he opened the scriptures to them. He clearly articulated what the scriptures said and made it plain to them who the Christ was. And that is the art of preaching and teaching. Opening the scriptures and making it plain for all to see. You know, when we simply open the word of God and we preach it, it has power to convict hearts. And it has power to transform your life and my life as we submit ourselves under it. As it washes over our hearts and purifies our hearts. We simply say what the word says. We don't add to it. We don't take away from it. We simply preach the word of God. I love Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God, notice, is living and active and full of power, making it operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit. That is the completeness of a person and of both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word is alive and it's powerful to change you as you read it, as you study it, as you meditate on it and allow it to wash over your heart And it has the power to reveal the condition, our true state of where we're really at. This is God's word given to mankind so that we would know how to have relationship with him. Oh man, he is the potter and we are the clay. He knows what we need. Verse four says, and some of them were persuaded And a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. Now notice, some of them were persuaded. That word persuade, it means to believe, to be persuaded of a thing concerning a person. So here Paul is in the midst of this synagogue, demonstrating and explaining to them, opening the scriptures, opening their understanding of who the Christ is, what the scriptures say about him. And it was the word of God who convicted their hearts And notice, they were persuaded to change their mind about the Messiah, change their mind and turn towards him and believe upon him. They placed their faith in him by him, by Paul simply just opening the word and letting the word do its job. And notice, because he preached the word, some of them, that is the Jewish men, believed. They were persuaded. And a great multitude of the devout Greeks, that is is, uh, Gentiles that had converted to Judaism, and they are now followers of Christ. And a large number of leading women in Thessalonica came to Christ. And so what an amazing thing. This is a work of the Holy Spirit that is going on in Thessalonica. It is the Holy Spirit's work to take the word of God and bring conviction and draw men into salvation. Salvation is not a work of man. It is a work of the Spirit. And as we simply open the word of God, God takes it, takes that word And he convicts hearts. And it's the Holy Spirit that opens our understanding to his truth for us to respond to it. Now there was a great move in Thessalonica. And Paul would go around the Roman Empire preaching this gospel. And that gospel had power to transform the lives of those that came in contact and heard the word of truth. And it changed the whole empire in just a few hundred years. Christianity made inroads into every city across the Roman Empire. And just as the gospel had the power to transform lives in the first century, the gospel has the same power to transform lives today. And God is in the business of going on and carrying out his mission to save the lost from sin. There's 8.1 billion people on our planet today. 32 uh, or 2.48 billion people are believers, or that's a statistic anyway. So there's a large portion of our world today that does not know Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ has given us a command to go into all the world to preach the gospel. And I love it with this, and I'll close with this quote from Edward Watts, a history professor at the University of California, San Diego. He said in his book, The Final Pagan Generation, Rome's Unexpected Path to Christianity. This was cited by Becky Little in her article, um, Five Ways Christianity Spread Through Ancient Rome. And it says, missionaries are part of the story, but most of the story is about regular Christians talking to regular people, he says. And that I think is the most important reason that Christianity emerges in the way that it does in the Roman world. 
It's not mission activity by people like Paul so much as it is people whose names we don't know. Not everybody is called to have a ministry like the Apostle Paul. Not everyone's called to go to the ends of the earth like the Apostle Paul did. But brothers and sisters, today, God wants to use everyday ordinary people like you and like me to testify to our neighbors, our coworkers, our family and friends about what our great God did for us by his amazing grace, his undeserved, unmerited favor poured out into our lives by the precious blood of his son. Oh, God is at work today. And God wants to use you to be a testimony of his great grace wherever he has you, in your workplace, among your family, among your friends, for the glory of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the great privilege to be called your sons and daughters. And Lord, we're so grateful that it is not us trying to attain standing in favor with you by us working like pack mules. But Lord, you reach down into this pit of miry clay and save the likes of us by pouring out your amazing grace, your unmerited, underserved favor through the finished work of your son into each of our lives that we've turned to you by faith. And Father, you are at work seeking and to save that which was lost. And I pray that this would be a church, we would be a church, your living body, taking that call seriously. Lord, that you would fill us afresh with your spirit today. And by your great grace, you would empower us and equip us to be your hands and feet today. We love you. Thank you again for your great work. Bless your people as they go. In Jesus' name, amen.